house this morning. And uh, all of you know why I'm here this morning. Brother Buddy fell off a ladder and hurt himself. So I'm here filling in for him. And by the way, you want to know if there's somebody that ain't got nothing to do tomorrow, will they come and hold the ladder for me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, me. Good to have David and his wife back with us today. God bless you. God bless you. All right, let's get our green hymn books and turn to 263. Revive us again. Folks, I'm going to tell you what this country, this country needs to revive in the day. Amen. Really needs it. 263. Revive us again. <laughs> But now 
He has comforted it and thou art your me. And besides all this, betwixt to us and you, there is a great gulf fixed that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us which would come from uh, come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, and he may testify unto them, lest they come to this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one has rose from the dead. I want to preach to you this morning on the subject, a parable that was not a parable. I personally do not believe this is a parable, though it has great Bible truths like parables do. And yet, and here's why I believe that, is because a proper name is used. In all the parables in the Bible, no proper name is used. But here in this, my thinking is it was an actual name that people knew. They knew of his lifestyle. They knew of his death. They knew of the beggar that was laid in his gate every day. But be that as it may be, there is a message here for us today. What it is a parable or an actual event. The great lesson is this. We have a choice. We had a choice, didn't we? Our choice is simple. Heaven or hell. Man, that is lays aside all theoretics. That lays aside everything except bad things. We make a decision to go to heaven. When I got saved, I made a decision, a mental decision, a life-changing decision that I wanted to be saved and I wanted to go to heaven. Unless I'd have made that choice, hell was a default. I was on my way there already. So I had to climb out of there and get in a different train going in a different direction. Now the scripture talks about, talks about hell. It said, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. All the nations. Man, I tell you, I'm standing in fearful tracks today because of what's going on in our nation today. When people start talking about tearing down the symbols of Christianity and, and uh, making movies that is uh, that's totally abstract from the things of God, that's, I, you know, there's a certain amount God will stand for and like He did in Sodom and Gomorrah, and then He said, enough is enough. Amen. But now the, uh, Daniel said, and many of them that slept in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting condemnation. In the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 8, John said, But the fearful and the unbeliever shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now there's about four things I want to look at in this, in, in this, uh, in this passage. First of all, there is the people in the story. The people in the story. First of all, there is the man of wealth. Early Bible, or early Bible folks, people give him the name Dives, and Dives simply means rich. Dives, the rich man. He was a man of wealth. A man of wealth. Compared to the most people in his day, who were lucky if they got one meal a day. The average person lived off of one meal a day, and if they could get meat one time a week, they were doing great. But here's a man who, uh, he had plenty. He could say, give me all the crack and no brain. Give me all the twinkly bars. Give me all the steaks. I'm going to eat all I want. A lot of the wealthier folks in Bible times died very early in life because of their eating style. They didn't know what was healthy and unhealthy. Uh, they just ate, ate, and ate, and ate. Now notice not only his, not only his wealth, but notice what he had on. The Bible said that he had robes and fine linen. 
guy that was purple. Purple was royalty. This guy was not just some average John Doe out here that had to strike it rich. He was, he was connected in some way to the leadership of the country. He fared in, in purple. And, uh, and the, uh, it's interesting that the Greek uses the word wolf and air. It was something so magnificent that the writer just could not really find a word for it. I remember the year I was a senior, this boy came to, uh, came to school. He was a senior too. had on a silk shirt. Now, these guys, well, these, uh, they, 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 these fertilizer sacks, huh? we gave them a hard time. <laughs> we learned it cost $16. Can you imagine a, church, uh, a shirt that cost $16 in 1959? Can you imagine that? We thought the guys lost his mind. He could have bought a set of tires for that. But here he is with this silk shirt. But we all admire the shirt and wish we had one like it. That's why we one week we were getting such a hard time. But this guy had on a robe that was purple, that was so magnificent, you just want to take it and touch it if you could. But not only that, he had he had an ungodly lifestyle. The Bible said he fared sumptuously every day. The word sumptuously means fared buoyantly or loud and obnoxious. He lived with the ways of the world. And he had another thing. He had a doctrine that was not from God. See, he thought he was going to heaven. He actually believed he was going to heaven. The doctrine of his day was this among the Jewish people. That if you were rich, and if you had prospered, it meant God was on your side and you were all right in the sight of God. But see, the thing of it is, he had a doctrine that wasn't from God. There are those today who would say, well, if you've been Christian as a baby, you're all right. There are those that would say, well, if you've been baptized, there are those Baptists that would say, well, if you're a member of the Baptist church, you're all right. Listen, you can go to hell from the front seat of a, of a Baptist church. Amen. It's not about that. It is about Jesus being in our heart. Amen. He had no thoughts of personal salvation. He thought he was all right. He thought he was all right. Now the devil will woo you into believing that you're all right when you're not all right. He'll make you believe that things are good when things are not good. Now that's one of the people, but now look at that not only the man of wealth, but the man he wants. Most of us, if we were going to relate to one, mentally at least, we would relate to uh, Lazarus, wouldn't we? The word Lazarus is a Latin word, and it means Elzar, which means in English, God is my help. In his darkest hour, he could say, God is my help. I never get to such a depressed state. I never get in circumstances. I never get in situations where in my heart I can't say, God is my helper. As a baby, when he was born, no doubt his parents looked at him and it's surprising me that he lived. Because in Bible times, if a child was born crippled or something wrong with them, they would simply terminate the life of the child. So he had blessed by having parents that allowed him to live. But he was not mobile. But he had a, somebody more than loved him that carried him down to this rich man's house every day. He was lame in his gate. He was not mobile. He not, could not get up and walk around. And very late, he was a he was a beggar and he was laid at the gate. Support. How is he going to live? Why is he here? Because Here's the way they ate by the time at least the richer folks. They would have no napkins in those days and they would take the bread and they would wipe their mouth with the bread and then they'd throw it down on the table. What was left and the poor people that had a little extra food, the dogs stayed on their table. But probably this man was in the upper crust of society and so they would simply take it out and they would give that food to those in need. Now one thing about the Jewish people, they may have had their faults, but they looked out 
as much as they could for one another. So he would take this food, and that is what Lazarus would live off of. The Bible calls it the crumbs, but uh, you kind of lose it in the translation because nobody can live off the crumbs that fell off my table. I don't think anybody else's. But it's talking about and that what they wiped their mouth with and cleaned their hands with was called crumbs in Bible time. If they had some nurses on duty, they were the dogs. They would come and they were licking sore. Now you can imagine, can you imagine in your heart, getting up there when you went to the mailbox every day and you get the mail, there was this beggar laying there, dogs licking his sores. His odor must have been absolutely terrible. But there he lay every day. But now let's look at the peculiar things in this story. First of all, there is heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven. If I would ask this morning, how many of you want to go to heaven? Everybody wants to go to heaven. At least that's what a lot of folks, everybody will tell you that, but not everybody is living like they want to go to heaven. Now here's what happened. The beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, not to heaven, not to paradise, but to Abraham's bosom. Now you've got to remember, Abraham's bosom was, a, if you will, a holding port where all the Old Testament souls were waiting. They had not yet been redeemed. They had been saved on the credit, if you will. And Jesus said to the said to the thief on the cross, the day thy shall will be will be in paradise. The Bible says during these three days that he was in the grave, they led the captive out of captivity. He speak to, he spoke to the souls or preached to the souls of those who were in bondage. What's he doing? He's leading those Old Testament souls that were saved under the law to a place that Jesus called paradise, and the word paradise means walled in garden. It's a beautiful place. But now at the end time, the writer of Revelation, John said, and I saw a new heaven, and I saw a new earth coming down. And we will be in paradise, we'll be moved to heaven. That's where the streets are going to be. That, that's where the gates of pearl is located at. So the Bible said that he was carried to Abraham's, Abraham's bosom. But now secondly, there is hell. The rich man died and was buried. You ask some people, what's going to happen to you when you die? Well, I guess I'm going to be buried. That'll be the end of you. No. That ain't the end of you. And they sweet for some folks if it was the end of That was not the end of the story. The Bible says, and it is appointed on the man who wants to die, and after that, the judgment. Now Jesus kind of pulls the curtains back on eternity, and He lets us look in what happens after death. And He lifted up His eyes in hell, being in torment, and He looked toward heaven, and the first time He really saw Lazarus as a human being. All those years, there he was, or months, or ever how long he was there, he was nothing but just a man. It's so easy to classify people in it. And forget, doesn't matter how we may look up or down, and folks, God loves their son. God loves their son. Now when he got to hell, he found two things. He found torment and distance. Torment to his body and distance from where God would be. Now, he cried for help. But there was no help in hell. Jesus describes hell in Mark 9 44. Where the worm died not and the fire is not quenched. His first concern was his personal well being. He said, Send Lazarus! Let him dip just a tip of his finger and cool my tongue. Listen, folks, he had adjusted his lifestyle. He didn't say, bring me a handful of water. He didn't say, send Lazarus with a bucket. 
He didn't say let him dip all of his finger in. He said let him dip just the tip of his finger and bring it and put it on my tongue so I can have some relief in this place. Now there's folks, when you tell them that, they say, well, God, no, that's not the way God is. Yes, folks, that's the way God is. Amen. We have a choice. Amen. We have a choice. But don't you know the harm of hell? It is too late. Abraham said, uh, I, I can't do that. There's a great gum fixed, you see. We can't go back and forth. When you leave this world, you're sealed in turn. Amen. Tell those who say, well, once you say, you know, I mean, once you die, then you be saved. No, the Bible says, at death find you, so shall the judgment. The pain was so great that he said, now, oh, Father Abraham, I want to send somebody to my brothers. I want you to raise Lazarus from the dead, and I want you to send him to my, to my brothers. Here's what the Revelation said. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire, well, the beast and the false prophets are. God didn't make hell for man. God made hell for the devil and the false prophets. The problem is, problem is, we get caught in the web of the devil. People get deceived and rock on in life. And then they, when they wind up in hell, it's too late then. So here's what uh, Abraham said. He said, they have... They have the law and they have the prophets. But here's what he said. The rich man said, but if one was raised from the dead, they would hear him. He's thinking in human terms. See, we're guilty of the same kind of thing. Oh, if we can just uh, get somebody in a good situation. If we just counsel them enough. If we just get them in better circumstances. Suppose you have a pig. You love that little pig. I mean, you had him, you had him washed up, cleaned up, perfumed up, and you decided you're going to take him to the opera with you. I'm not talking about the grand old opera. I'm talking about that. <laughs> that kind of opera. And you would took him to the opera. You know what you have when you got to the opera? You have a pig. Nothing changed about it. See, you can expose people to all good things. But unless something happens in somebody's heart, nothing happens in their life. Nothing whatsoever. So Jesus said, now listen, they have the laws and they have the prophets. Let them hear, let them hear that. Rich man had a great plan. But God said, no, it won't work. But here's the reality. There is a hell. A lot of modern folks don't, don't want to believe that. They want to say, no, it's just a parable. It's just an example. Uh, it's, just a, it, it, it's just a picture. Well, folks, I, if it's a picture, can you imagine what the real place would, would be like? It was originally made for the devil and his angels. But let's look. Let's, don't ever end a sermon on hell. Let's talk about heaven now, folks. Can we do that? Let's talk about heaven. Heaven is a place. Heaven is a place, and Jesus described it this way. A home not made with human hands. On the way to church down 33, there's some houses going up. Ain't no how it is when you drive by and you keep up with the progress. We look at these houses who are coming by and we say, well, they didn't do anything this week. Or man, they really went up on you. But you know what? Who's building that? Human hands are building those houses. But Jesus said, a home that's not made by human hands. For Paul said, for we know if our earthly house or this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made by hands, eternal in the glory. Why not made by hands? Because first of all, there is no architect, there is no gardener that can design it. Amen. It is so beautiful, there is no imagination that could imagine what it would be like. In our, in our wildest imagination, somebody described it this way. If you took the Lazarus of Begging, 
Have you took the most beautiful place down here you've ever seen? Now, I thought it was a pretty magnificent place. Amen. And you have too. And you took that magnificent place and you put it in heaven. And Lazarus looked around. He would not have what you carried up. It would be so obsolete and so ugly. So first of all, it is not made by human hands because of the beauty. And then if it was touched by human hands, it would be defiled. But there's one word I'm going to pick up on in this. He said, for the foundation of it, for he, the Bible said that Abraham looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now why foundation? What does that tell me? That tells me that it's a physical place. If it was mirage, if it was an imaginary thing, it would need no foundation. What is a foundation? You want to hit something that supports something. So it's talking about a physical heaven. It's not something that's in just in, in, our, in our mind or in our heart. Our desire in life is to go to heaven. That's a, that is a, one of the motivating factors, maybe the motivating factor that first brings us to God. Let me go back to my own life. What brought me to God, uh, what brought me to God, I got scared of going to hell. We had a lady come to our house. I told you, shared this with we before. Witness to it. Nobody ever sat down and told me about the Lord. I went to church last Monday. The boy was growing up. But nobody ever sat down with me and told me, now this ain't get saved. And you know what God did? I didn't get saved right then. But the next Sunday, we went to church. When she went to church, well, she went to church the whole town preaching. And she got saved, and a week later, guess what happened? I got saved. And I told you, the young bullet preached the longest sermon in history that Sunday night. They wanted to get saved. But it's been a great journey. That happened 55 years ago. Amen. 55. I've been walking with Jesus. 55 years. I don't tell you that it's just sweet. Sweet. Every day. Whatever circumstances may come. If the doctor comes in and says, son, you got two weeks to leave. Well, look here, man. That's me. I'm going to be in my, I, I'm going to be there in that garden, that wall in the garden. Praise the Lord. It is the glory of the Lord. The greater you hair gets, the more beautiful heaven becomes. Amen. Amen. Let's pray again. Blessed Heavenly Father, God is sing the song of this invitation this morning. God, I pray if there's anyone here that's not made a commitment or a faith to Jesus Christ and they can't say in their heart, I know if I died right now, I'd go to hell. Lord, I pray that person you know, person will come forward this morning and receive you as a personal Savior. But Lord, assuming everybody here is Christian, they're still going here, Lord. There's people we have in our life that's lost. We know they lost. And, and, and we want to sit, we want to be willing in heaven. We want to stroll over heaven, Lord. And God, I know a lot of that is praying. People praying. People praying. And Lord, I pray that you sing the invitation song. And for folks here that just need to come and pray. Well, they pray for somebody else. They pray for their own children. God. Lord, I pray the altar would be a welcome place. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me now. Let's sing one verse. What one verse.
we get about our singing now today.